Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. Have you ever met Chris France? No, I haven't, I don't think, unless he's going to sort of suddenly come up tell me some terribly embarrassing thing that happened in the 80s. No, I never met him. I've never met any of them except for David Byrne. Right. Where do you meet um, David? I met him at a dinner party at Timothy Leary's house. Were you tuned in or were you dropping out? I was tuned in, turned on, and then I did drop out. Yeah, no, it was a ridiculous guest list, that thing. But um, Winona Ryder uh, was there. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I, I went with David Gilmore. It sounds stage. like the early 90s. Uh, late 80s. Oh, late 80s, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But Chris is interesting, obviously, because he comes out of the whole New York scene, that, that mid-70s art scene. It's so, so interesting, the genesis of the New York punk scene and how, I, I don't want to say anything about it, like, there's so much I want to touch on on this. It's, but, it's from reading his book, it's fascinating. Television, you know, Blondie, I mean, obviously the Ramones to a certain extent. The Ramones, and there's this amazing moment, this is in 77, when all four of them are playing in Glasgow on the same night. Blondie and television are in the sold-out Apollo, and the Ramones and Talking Heads are playing somewhere else. I mean, worst booking yeah, but guy, idea guy, ever. This ain't no Mud Club or CBGBs. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got the Tom Tom Club and we've got Talking Heads all in this one man, right? There's so much here. I know. I can't wait. We're probably not going to say anything. We're just going to sit here like idiots. Let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. I know you're musicians, but you've been more professional than a lot of journalists. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at yeah. something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. I'm here live and in person. Let me just uh, turn on my, my lighting so I have good lighting. Will you be broadcasting video or just it's audio? It's just audio, but we like to have sort of video clips of your more oh, okay. scintillating cool. comments, Chris. Of which <laughs> be, so having been listening to your voice for the last few days, I'd actually started reading your book last year and then I got caught up in something else. And I, and I said to myself, I don't have time, so I've, I've changed the audio book. You've got a very laconic speaking voice. I know. Had I been able to choose somebody else to read it, I would have, but they insisted I did it. And um, Who would you have got? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Vincent Price. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Chris. I'm so sorry I'm late for this, but I just had to quickly, while the titles were before. running. This is so embarrassing. I don't think you're late. So it's that's good a to lovely see looking you. den you've got there, Chris. This is what we call our music room. You can see some drums and get Frankly, I can't think what else you would call it. <laughs> is this in Connecticut? You're in Connecticut, right? Yes. And is this the clubhouse? You some you've done some live yes. Tom Tom Club yes. recordings is, there, right? This is where we recorded our live album. And we have tie lines that connect to a proper studio upstairs. And uh, we've done a, a, some good records here, if I do say so myself. I think we met, Gary, didn't we, we did. in, when you were in Nassau? We did. I was just at telling Compass. Guy, yeah, I, we were making the True album at Compass Point and yeah. you were doing uh, Speaking in Tongues, weren't you? 82, this would have been. Uh, let's see. No, we didn't do Speaking in Tongues until 83. No, no, maybe we did. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. But didn't you and Tina have an, a, a, get one of the studio apartments? Yes, we because I, I used to go and stay with Robert Palmer a lot down there, and he told me that but you'd come through on a boat with Tina's dad and fallen in yeah, love with the place yeah. and got an apartment. Yeah, <laughs> we kept a sailboat down in Nassau for many, many years, and um, it was Chris Blackwell who said you should get a boat. And um, Tina's father was a retired admiral and a, an avid sailor, and I had not done much sailing in my life, a little. But, but Tina and her family had done a lot. So, so we said, yeah, let's get a boat. And the funny story is that, you know, when we, we did the first Tom Tom Club album, when we decided we were going to do it, we were kind of forced to do it because 
David was doing a solo album and then Jerry, our keyboard player was doing mm-hmm. a solo album. And so Tina and I said, what are we going to do? And we decided to make a record also because our accountant said, you better do something because between the two of you, you've only got $2,000 in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> that was after the Remain in Light tour, which was, wow. a, which was a very successful and historic tour, but yeah. expensive and uh, nothing was left at the end. In fact, we lost money. Wow. But that was common. But, that used to be common, wasn't it? I mean, you couldn't do that now because it's the only money yeah. there is. Well, we would get tour support yeah. from the various record companies, which helped a lot. Because playing live used to be the promotion for the record where you made yeah. the money. Yeah. So anyway, Chris Blackwell offered us, Tina and I, a, uh, a record deal. But Seymour Stein in America kind of passed. That's Sire Records, right? Yeah. Yeah, Sire Records. They didn't really pass. They offered us, I think, $10,000. And we said, you know, we can't even really make a good single for that amount of money, at least in those days. And uh, so we had no deal in America. And then one day, Seymour Stein woke up and noticed that Chris Blackwell was shipping all these records into America, 12-inch singles, and selling like hotcakes. I mean, really, we sold, I think, a half a million singles or something like that. And he woke up and said, oh, I guess I should offer Chris and Tina a better deal. And he called our manager, Gary Kerfus. He said, Gary, I want to offer Chris and Tina a better deal. And, and Gary said, oh, no, Seymour, there's not enough money in the world that they would make a deal with you now. <laughs> <laughs> and so Seymour said, oh, come on, Gary, what would it take? Come on, what would it take? And Gary said, well, enough to buy a boat. <laughs> so that's how we got our boat. And that was Wordy Rapping Hood or Genius of Love? Uh, well, it was the first Tom Tom Club album, which included both of both those of, yeah. songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is a I mean, fantastic album. Yeah, we just got certified platinum this past week. It only took 40 years, but we got there. Paul, congratulations <laughs> on that. Cause it's God, you were just saying that you, well, you I was just, knew no, it's their funny, manager. It's, it's a tenuous little link. It's just because the one time I met Gary Kerfus was actually at Chris Blackwell's house in Nassau on New Year's Eve, in fact, yeah. And I remember cause Robert Palmer told me some story about apparently Gary was a very keen art collector. He was. And he was. And they, there was a joke they used to have that whenever you guys went on tour, that people say, oh, Gary's seen a painting. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> but Gary was an adventurous collector. I may have been at that New Year's Eve party, by the way. I think I would have noticed. I don't know. Wow. Because it was it was quite dull, guy. You may oh, not have noticed. Dull? Oh, <laughs> it, no, it was actually quite dull. I'd actually come all the way. I just come from Tokyo from finishing a tour, via all the way across America, and made it to the just for New Year's Eve, and then we went up to Chris Blackwell's house, and we were actually back at Robert's house watching Scarface by half past twelve. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think I was at that party. <laughs> no, I, I think if you'd been at that party, I probably would have stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> I went to some parties, uh, New Year's Eve parties at Chris Blackwell's house that were the opposite of dull. That were Grace Jones was there and, and Timothy Leary and Dennis Hopper. Oh, man. But let's talk about Compass Point for a little bit, because you became part of this famous Compass Point All Stars, didn't you? Which includes Sly and Robbie and, uh, and you know various musicians that would play Bobby on Bataru. various, yeah, and they'd play well, on different artists' records. I was not a, an official member of the Compass Point All Stars, but I was good friends with all of them, and uh, had great respect for them. And I did play on a couple of things like that were never released <laughs> like a joe cocker album i thought it was pretty cool but his manager like killed it and uh, redid it with sly and robbie but yeah. it was quite a scene it was quite a studio wasn't it and obviously when you amazing. were doing speaking in yes. tongues and we were doing true and i remember being very shy about talking to you guys uh, you know because you, you were huge influence on especially the early Spandau Ballet that we were doing, like chart number one. I mean, listening to sort of Remain in Light, that really did affect us in that it allowed white punks to play funk. That was kind of what yeah. you guys were doing. There was obviously a scene coming out of there, but weren't you at the same time making that first Tom Tom 
album, uh, no, second Tom Tom Club album at the same time. It seems almost like within weeks you had two big albums out at once. In 82, we did the second Tom Tom Club album, and I guess we began uh, speaking in tongues also. Yeah, it was a busy time. And we were touring, too, like crazy. So that second Tom Tom Club album, I'm afraid, got a little rushed. We weren't really ready to do it yet. But you know how it is. When things are rolling, you got to, like, do everything you can to keep them rolling. And how did David feel about you having a, an alternative record out at the same time as the Talking Heads record? David was kind of uh, noncommittal about it. Let's put it that way. He didn't really give a shit. Well, he was the first person to do it. I mean, he'd done My Life in the Bush of Ghosts was the first of the solo albums, wasn't it? So, Yeah. Well, that was with Eno. That was so with I, Eno, didn't, yeah. I don't know if you really call it a solo album. That's true. Uh, that's true. Okay. He did a thing called The Catherine Wheel. That's right, which, yes. Uh, which was the music for a, a dance performance by Twyla Tharp. And it's a great record, but it sold about two copies. <laughs> well, maybe 2000. Yeah. Because obviously there's a lot of stories about David and you. We'll, we'll get to those. Uh, Sorry, okay. guys. Because I think we need to go right back, right? Because I have, you haven't read your book. There, this whole thing of, of you starting off at RISD, that the Rhode Island School of Design, which just sounds kind of Elysian and wonderful, this kind of community. But what's interesting, it, and the way that you, you talk about, especially with Tina, just how being artists was really informing your work, which actually marks you out from most American bands that we know. Because in Britain, all our bands went to art school. It was part of it. Every band, someone went to art school. It's like all great British music from the, of the 70s was informed by an art education. You know, all the way back to Pete Townsend is Jasper John's Union Jacks. Yet it's quite unusual for you guys and to the point where like Patti Smith sneered at you, <laughs> I believe, yeah. going to art school. I think the question is, did you want to be a musician or an artist? Well, I wanted to be both. I started playing drums when I was a young kid, but by the time I got to what we call high school, 15, 16 years of age, I read this book called The Moon and Sixpence by Somerset Maugham. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is loosely based on Paul Gauguin. It really inspired me, even though Gauguin, you know, left his family and was a pretty selfish guy. He led this really romantic life and moved to Tahiti and all that. And I thought, wow, you know, that sounds really enticing. <laughs> and I had always enjoyed drawing, but I, I hadn't really studied it or anything. At my high school, there was a, an art teacher. His name was David Miller. I decided, oh, I'm, I'm going to take this studio art class from David Miller. And he taught us about drawing and painting and collage and sculpture and and he always played great music in the studio. This was in the late 60s, so it would be like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and The Who. Mm -hmm. The Who had just come out with Tommy. You know, so it was heady atmosphere. And David Miller introduced us to uh, Willem de Kooning and Andy Warhol and uh, Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg and, and yeah. the contemporary artists of that time. I got really into the painting and drawing, and I was so into it that he allowed me to skip sports, which were kind of mandatory at the end of the day, and I could go to the painting studio and work instead of playing football or whatever. So uh, I got really into it, and I thought, I could be a painter. I would like to be a painter. The same way I felt like I would like to be in a rock and roll band. <laughs> to me, they kind of went hand in hand somehow. Yeah. One thing led to another, and I, I started getting more and more committed to painting. And he said, David Miller said to me, Chris, I think you should go to the Rhode Island School of Design. And he had sent a couple, well, actually three boys from our school there the previous year. And I said, well, you're going to have to talk to my parents about this because I don't think they're going to dig the idea of me going to art school after this expensive private school education he said okay i'll talk to them and he he said uh mr and mrs france or actually general and mrs france i think your son should go to the rhode island school of design and my parents were like what how will he ever support himself 
And uh, my father had gone to Harvard Law School. So David Miller was no dummy. He said, you know, the Rhode Island School of Design is like the Harvard of art schools. And my parents said to each other, oh, it's the Harvard of art schools. <laughs> well, so I ended up going. And that's where I'm, I met a lot of cool people, especially Tina Weymouth and David Byrne. Wow. And your relationship with Tina began there. I mean, it's still going. I mean, this is this yeah. is one of the the this great stories, the great, the romantic great stories, love stories. Of, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. You know, it's yeah it, it is. I mean, I'm a very lucky guy in many ways, but especially to have met Tina. So, how did the music start at this point, and where did you meet? And, and tell me about that. Tell us about that first meeting with Tina. Okay, I was painting, 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 and I started missing my drums, missing playing drums. I didn't have any drums there, so I called up my father in Pennsylvania. He was such a great guy. He said, okay, uh, <laughs> when I asked him to bring my drum set up to Rhode Island, it's like, you know, practically a thousand miles. Maybe it's a oh, 750 God. miles or something <laughs> like that. He put them in the back of the family station wagon, drove them up to me. And so then I had drums. Well, I was playing around, along with records at the time, like uh, Mott the Hoople and stuff like Yay, that. Hey, come yeah. on. David Bowie. Yeah. And also, like, among my many favorites was uh, were the Stax bands, Booker T and the MGs and Otis Redding and, you know, Southern. Funk was but, already with you. Uh, yeah. We called it Soul. Well, because your first band, wasn't it The Brotherhood was the first... Yeah, I played. I, I, I want to hear about a, that. That sounds fantastic. I, I joined a band. I was asked to join a band by a guy who played trumpet. He had a band called The Brotherhood, and they were a soul, a bona fide soul band. You like, think? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so uh, I had a really good time with that. But we played one show, which was a big party at the Rhode Island School of Design. Then he graduated and the band split. And uh, that was that. So I thought, I'm going to start up my own band. And I got together with David Byrne and three other guys. Actually, I was asked to do uh, some audio for a, a friend who was in the film school at RISD. He was making a movie about his girlfriend getting run over by a car. And he said... <laughs> He said, Chris, I need some real cacophonous music to go with the car crash. And I said, oh, OK, I can do that. And um, I was keeping my drums in Tina's little carriage house where she lived. Uh, my neighbors didn't like it in my apartment when I played the drums. So I kept them at Tina's carriage house. And I said to my friend, meet me at the carriage house. And uh, here's the address and bring your Revox. So he did. And he said, do you mind if I bring a friend who plays guitar? And I said, sure, that would be great. And he brought his friend and his friend was a guy named David Byrne. And together, David and I played some cacophonous music that crescendoed and then faded out. The filmmaker was very happy with the results. And, and afterwards, I said, David, I was thinking of starting a band. Would you be interested? And he said, I guess so. And so uh, <laughs> David and I began calling up our friends. Actually, I began calling up my friends and saying, uh, I know you play great guitar. You want to be in this band with, with me and David Byrne? And we got a five-piece band together. We called ourselves the Artistics. And the, the sole purpose of the artistics, our raison d'etre, was to entertain our friends, you know, to have some fun and entertain our friends at parties. And Tina wasn't playing bass with you at this point. At Tina all, was right? not, although she was a big fan of the artistics. Oh, she's just a good girlfriend. <laughs> For God. Well, yeah, both. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Loyal. Uh, yeah, loyal both. girlfriend. And Tina had a car. None of us had a car, so she was able to help us move our equipment and everything. She was really great about that. And um, one day, David and I said to each other, maybe we should try writing our own songs. We were a cover band. We did 
I'm waiting for my man by the Velvet Underground. Mm -hmm. I'm not your stepping stone by Paul Revere and the Raiders. We did I Can't Explain by the Who. Yeah. Were, were uh, you doing Take Me to the River at that point? Yeah, I was going to ask that. No, but we were doing Love and Happiness uh, by Al right. Green. We did that. And we also That's did. That's quite complicated. <laughs> yeah, and we actually did Tracks of My Tears by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. We loved all kinds of stuff. And but one day we said, well, maybe we should try writing a song of our own. And uh, Tina and I were sharing a painting studio at the time. And one day there was a knock on the door and I opened it and there was David standing there with his acoustic guitar, which was really a very crappy acoustic guitar with paint splattered on it and everything. And he said, I've got the beginnings of a song. I wonder if you could help me finish it. And we said, sure, come on in. And he played the first verse and chorus of Psycho Killer. Wow. And uh, So this is the first song you ever wrote? Yeah. Yeah. And it, this was in 1973, the winter of 73. And uh, Tina and I th both thought, wow, this is great. I thought this is especially great. It's like a mashup of the Velvet Underground and Otis Redding or something like that. Who came up with Keskase? David came up with Keskase. Well, was that a sort of hip thing? Were you all into sort of French Nouveau well, films? Well, there's a great further story from this guy, isn't it? Is that Tina wrote the incredibly classical French Middle Age. We. Oui. Oui. <laughs> yes, she did. Well, David had, first of all, he said the song was inspired by Alice Cooper who was enormously popular at the time in America. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with, with these macabre songs yeah, that yeah. he wrote. And so Psycho Killer was kind of like a, you know, it could have been an Alice, the title of an Alice Cooper song. Anyway, David had asked another person to help him with the song, a Japanese girl. He had imagined that the middle eight should be in a foreign language to imply that this Psycho Killer was having some kind of psychotic episode where suddenly everything changes languages and the japanese girl found out the song was about a psycho killer and she, she said oh no <laughs> and she literally ran away <laughs> but i knew that tita had spoken her mother is french and she had spoken french in the home and was very fluent and her great-grandfather was a famous breton poet so i said Tina could do that middle eight. And she said, okay. And uh, she sat down and, and wrote it in a, about an hour, I would say. And I wrote a couple more verses, lyrics for a couple more verses. And by the end of the afternoon, we had this great song, Psycho Killer, which we proceeded to play with the artistics. And we noticed it got a really fantastic reaction from our friends. Like they dug The Who and they dug The Velvet Underground and everything, but they loved this song, Psycho Killer. So we kept playing it. But it wasn't with Tina playing it? No, Tina was not in the band at that time. Because I always think of that bass line as being yeah, quite exactly, distinctive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, I wish we had a recording. I actually can't remember exactly what Hank played. I have a feeling it was something similar, but I have a feeling that Tina later refined it and... Uh, made it her own but at this point i had already asked tina to be in the band when we were first forming it and she said oh no 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 that's not for me that's guy stuff rock and roll is a boys club and it'd just be too much trouble for me and i said okay fair enough uh you know i understand but i kept at it i kept at it i kept I would show her like a, a picture of a new suzy quattro album and i'd say <laughs> look tina this is a woman playing the bass. Look how, <laughs> how great she looks, you know? Yeah, and that's literally the only role model, isn't it? That's, the, you know, before the runaways, there's literally no one. Yeah, there weren't very many. Tina, on the other hand, somehow knew about Carol Kay. Oh, of course, Carol Kay. Well, I mean, in bands. And, yeah. I didn't even know about Carol Kay, but I guess Tina was thinking about, well, women bass players, and she must have looked it up or something. This was uh, before Google. So. That's what I was going to say. How do you look at, you know, you had to really look things up then, like go to the library. Because yeah. <laughs> what, what, what you and Tina 
have and certainly must have had then i guess is is this funk sensibility this this yeah rhythm that isn't just like any other punk band or a rock band i mean it is something pretty unique that moment when she suddenly started playing you went wow that's that's who you are you know it I finally got Tina to join the band after we all had moved to New York. Tina, David, and I moved to New York. And, well, David moved in the summer of 74, and we moved in the uh, late September, early October of 74. And even then, she was still saying, no, no, I'm committed to painting. She saw David and I struggling to form a band, trying to find somebody with you know with a like mind that would share a similar aesthetic to us uh, who sorry just to sidetrack you a tiny bit but who was that band you wanted to be who was out there at that time was it sort of like jonathan richmond well jonathan richmond was definitely and the modern lovers we should just say the modern lovers we did have their record. We got their record when it came out. But that was later, wasn't it? Because this, this is something that I find fascinating about. Because when you moved to New York, sorry to sidetrack again, but back in, when you moved to your, into this war zone that is the Bowery, I mean, it's interesting because your story reads parallel to Debbie and Chris's, isn't it? Of living in this kind of unbelievable hellhole. I mean, after the kind of the sort of security of RISD, must have yeah. been. And there's you and all these other bands. What becomes the punk scene is so different to the UK one in that it seems a much more organic, gentle people just coalescing towards something rather than... And you're all so different anyway. You know, the four bands, isn't it, really? Yeah. Those four bands would have been Talking Heads and... Talking Heads, Ramones, Ramones, Blondie, Blondie and Television. And Patty, Patty Smith. Smith. All this stuff is happening because it's the date that through it's 74. Is that this stuff is all happening a lot earlier than we tend to think with the punk timeline. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a very rich time period there on the Bowery. And, you know, it wasn't just the punk thing that was happening. There was also conceptual art and filmmaking and dance and uh, acting. Mm-hmm. It sounds so romantic and hellish at the same time in your book. Yeah, it was a nice mixture of the two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we moved there, and eventually Tina realized that she was the best person for the job of playing <laughs> bass. It was not even determined at that time that David would be the singer. We were really in a amorphous state, you could say, uh, just trying to get something going. Uh, one day I screwed up my courage after seeing her perform. I I walked up to Debbie Harry and I said, Debbie, would you like to sing in our band? This is David Byrne. He and I are starting a band. Would you be interested? And she said, well, I've already got a band, but you could buy me a drink. <laughs> and, uh, and we've been friends ever since. Uh, that, I actually that, uh, co-wrote a song and produced it for her years ago. It's one of my excellent. prouder things. Excellent. She's a wonderful artist. Yeah. We need to just to paint this scene, right, of, of, of what it is like at this point. Because is it coalescing around CBGBs right at that moment? And the guy who ran it, uh, Hilly Crystal. Hilly Crystal, yeah. Yes. There had been some kind of a scene at Max's Kansas City, mm. but Max's was sold. That and... was more glam rock, wasn't it, really, in many ways? Was it Neil Dolls? Neil Dolls. Kind of, yeah. Well, all kinds of people played Max's Kansas yeah. City, the, the Velvet Underground, even... Bob Marley and the Whalers once opened oh, for wow. Bruce, Bruce Springsteen there. What? So, so that, <laughs> oh, that's right. I think Bowie famously gig. saw Bruce at, at Max's Kansas City. Yes, I think. Yeah. Uh huh. That's yeah. right. Well, and invited him to Philadelphia to the Young American session. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a scene there, but the, uh, by the time we got to New York, Max's had been sold to a new owner who was not as cool as the original owner. We played there once or twice. But our allegiance was really to CBGBs. You know, uh, CBGBs was like a clubhouse because if you had ever played at CBGBs, even only one time, then you didn't have to pay the cost of admission to get in the next time you went. (laughs) So all these musicians would hang out there because they could get in for free and hang out all night and nurse a couple of beers. And have the chili. Uh, yes and have the chili if you were so inclined but the people who were on the edge artistically speaking would congregate there 
again, not just musicians, but also artists and filmmakers and writers. So who did you see play there? Well, the first band I saw was the Ramones. Who you thought were a Mexican band, right? <laughs> well, I thought they might have been because I had walked into CBGBs the first night I moved to New York. My friend said, Chris, there's something going on at this place across the street called CBGBs, and I think you should check it out. So I went, and uh, there was nothing, nothing happening at all. It was practically dark. The bartender was there, and I asked for a beer. And I heard a pool game going on in the back. I went back there, and there were some guys shooting pool. One of them was dressed in a, a silver sharkskin suit with like a purple shirt and a black tie, or maybe a black shirt and a purple tie. And he had these wraparound sunglasses, silver, like Elvis Presley wore at the time. <laughs> Very closely cropped haircut. I said, any music going on tonight? And he said, no, man, but... Come back on, on Friday. The Ramones will be here. And he, he had a real, obviously, Mexican accent. And so I thought, oh, the Ramones, maybe they're a Mexican band. So I said, yeah, I'll come back. And I did. And I saw the Ramones, and clearly they were not from Mexico, but they were amazing. <laughs> they were amazing. This was in the days when they would... They were just getting going and they would stop in the middle of a song and argue with each other. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, Johnny, I don't want to play. I don't want to go down to the basement. I want to play. I don't want to walk around with you. Uh, <laughs> Johnny was quite famously antagonistic, right? Yes, Johnny was, was a tough cookie. So I saw the Ramones and I thought, oh, this is great. They're like a conceptual art band or something. Then the next band I saw was television. And oh, God. the next band I saw was the Patti Smith group. And then there was a sort of early version of Blondie. I think they called themselves the Snake and the Snatch. <laughs> and, uh, right. Uh, okay. That was. I mean, uh, David Coverdale might have considered. But probably. in many ways, <laughs> I suppose television were the sort of closest to where you were going to go in a way, weren't they? It's sort of aesthetically, sort yes. of slightly oblique. Yes. One little curveball before we get back on this, which is a sort of a question I don't think ever gets asked, is that CBGBs, right, which was started as country and bluegrass Barry, right, because Hilly's whole thing was that was the music he loved. Did anyone ever actually play any country or bluegrass at CBGBs? Well, <laughs> as far as I know, it wasn't until much, much later. Like <laughs> Tommy Ramone, the original drummer of the Ramones, started a bluegrass band. Oh, OK, there you called go. Called Uncle Monk. And they played there. And also this guy, Alan Jackson, a big country and Western star, played there. And he met Hilly somewhere. And Hilly said, would you play my... And this was like in the, the 90s. What if it was driving Hilly mad? I mean, he's, you know, become one of the most important people in sort of 20th century culture. But the guy just wanted some country music in his bar. Yeah, yeah, he loved country. <laughs> but in fact, Hilly was very open-minded when it came to music. A, a lot of people don't know it, but he, he was very well-trained in music. This is what's extraordinary. Is This is what I mean, that this scene that's... None of you have communicated anything to each other. There's no family tree that started, right? It, it's literally just the Ramones were the Ramones, you were you, television were television, Bonnie were Bonnie, and you literally just coalesce around this club. That's what I find extraordinary. Yeah, because it's yeah. not really similar musically either, is it? No, there's no, a, but there's, so there's obviously some... It's art. Yeah, but, but it, and it's not, it's not a reaction. You were just doing what you were doing. What I do then find interesting is, is that because, like, punk for us was all about year zero, everything shit, throw it all away, start again. But the punk ethos you had were like, when you ever talk about the covers songs you ever did, and it's like, you know, Take Me to the River, stuff like that, and then I Can't Explain, um, Stepping Stone, it's all old. It's all old stuff. It's all like the general thing. To, there's this rejection of essentially the Woodstock ethos. Yeah. Uh, the whole hippie thing. And I don't even wonder if that was even conscious or it's just like, this is the music we like. Well, it was the music we like, but mm. with Talking Heads, we all agreed that we couldn't out stone the Rolling Stones. We couldn't outdo the Who at what they did and certainly couldn't outdo the Beatles or something like that at what they did. 
or the New York Dolls, who were enormously popular. Mm -hmm. We couldn't outdo, you know, David Johansson and Johnny Thunders at their high heel thing. So <laughs> we, had, we had the idea that we should just be ourselves, be like art students, like a very uh, earnest, very earnest about what we were doing and um, not put on any airs of being show business superstars. You know, we're just going to be ourselves and we're going to present an act that is like uh, yeah. suburban in many ways. Yeah. Different from other people's act. But a kind of suburban, preppy kind of art school thing, as opposed to sort of Richard Hell and all of that kind of yeah, yeah. stuff. Right. <laughs> so, Chris, we're, I know we're, we're sort of getting... I, somehow Tina's joined the band, and you're about to do your first gig at CBGB's. Yeah. It's supporting someone, isn't it? Yes, it was supporting the Ramones. You know, we've been rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and working on the Talking Heads repertoire in our loft and Tina and David and I all lived together and we had day jobs. And then after our day jobs, we would come home, make dinner, and then we would rehearse. And we did this for about a year. And then finally, I thought, we've got enough songs to do a half hour set. That's what people did at CBGBs. They played it. Little over a half hour, maybe. Which in the remote case is 50 songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I screwed up my courage and I went to Hilly Crystal and I said, Hilly, and he recognized me as being one of his regular customers. I said, We've got a band and uh, we'd like to audition. I knew that they had these audition nights. And uh, he said, Well, Audition night's already all booked up, but I could put you on in front of the Ramones on Thursday night. And if it goes OK, you can do Friday and Saturday, too. So I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> OK, I accepted. And then I went back and told David and Jerry, and we didn't even have a name for the band yet. So we had to uh, quickly think of a name, which ended up being Talking Heads, because a friend of ours who was visiting us said, he knew we were looking for a band name. And he said, I was reading TV Guide magazine. Like, who reads TV Guide magazine? But he did. And All he students. Said, he said there was a glossary of television terminology. And one of the things in the glossary was talking heads, which means the most boring, but also the most informative format of programming on television. So... We thought, oh, Talking Heads, that sounds cool. And we, we went with it. So we did the audition. We opened for the Ramones. And the question was, uh, would Johnny Ramone like us enough after we played the Thursday night to also play the Friday and the Saturday night? And uh, I heard him speaking to Hilly and, and he said, oh, yeah, they suck. They really suck. But. They can open for us. I guess his, his, his thinking was that we would not steal the spotlight from them. Yeah. That's always what you want. And let's face it, let's be honest. We all want rubbish support acts. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, we got to do the uh, the Friday and the Saturday night also. And, and then we were just totally hooked on this new band that we were in talking heads did Seymour Stein appear on the one night I mean how did you end up getting signed to his label because your first single wasn't even Psycho Killer was it yes Seymour came down it must have been it was some time after that you had the weird thing with Lou Reed didn't you before that when he yes, tried to yes. sign you you know <laughs> in the beginning there were very few people at CBGB's in the audience like that night we played with the Ramones there was maybe tops 20 people but later on, things kind of snowballed and people started coming down. And we spoke to record company people from Europe and Japan and the West Coast of America. And, and one night, Seymour came back. He was down there with Lenny Kay. And uh, he had come to see the Ramones. And he did sign the Ramones. But he was uh, very enamored with Talking Heads. And uh, we had to tell him, Seymour, we're not ready to make a record yet. And he was like, what? <laughs> he couldn't believe it. That's incredibly self-aware. 
Can I just say, because for anyone at that age, you just go, yeah, yeah, I want to make a record. Right. It was tempting, but we made him wait about 18 months, I think it was. Wow. He was having a nervous breakdown about it, he has said, because he was quite sure that some other record company would scoop us up and offer us more money and that would be that. You were just but, holding on to your virginity, weren't you, really? <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of, sort of. but we had made some demos and things, and we, we realized we're not really ready to re- record an album yet. we got to hone our craft, and we got to get better at our stage shows. And, we, you know, there is room for improvement here. <laughs> wow. That's really... No, and then but, but, but no, he was talking about Lou Reed. Did he try to sign you? Yeah, this, they offered you yeah. some like dreadful kind of boy band deal where they just, he just owned everything, right? Well, yeah. What happened was one of the reasons we moved to New York was because of Lou Reed, you know, because mm-hmm. he lived there. Another reason was because Andy Warhol was there. These guys were inspiring to us. So when Lou Reed came backstage and said. Hey, you guys want to come up to my apartment after the show? We said, yeah. (laughs) And we did. We went up to his apartment after the show. And, you know, it was late at night, maybe two o'clock in the morning or something like that. It's in my book, the the whole story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrible spoon and the ice cream. Yeah. (laughs) The thing about this horrible spoon, was this spoon being used for drugs or something? Well, it was bent and blackened, so what do you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he was very supportive to us for many years until he sadly passed away. Yeah. He was always great to Talking Heads. But the deal that his manager offered us was a standard, like, boilerplate production deal. And uh, we took it to a lawyer, and the lawyer said, oh, no, I would never allow my clients to sign one of these deals because what it means is while the producer pays for the recording of the album, he also owns the album and can sell it to the highest bidder, whoever that might be. And uh, you have no say in where the album goes or or anything. Oh, and, wow. and also the producer makes all the money if the album's a hit, which is why so many, you know, soul and R&B artists got ripped off because they made production deals. Yeah. When, when you finally get into the, the studio to do your first single, Love, um, I never know how to pronounce the arrow. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's a mathematical thing. That's a David Byrne thing. Love goes to building yeah, on fire. Yeah, of course, fire. goes to building on fire. But um, there's a character in here that was mentioned in one of our Rock on Tours episodes a few months ago with John Bon Jovi. And, that, and that's his yes. cousin, right? Yes, so, yes. But Anthony Bon Jovi. Oh. Tony Bangiovi. I never knew he featured in your story. So he produces your first single. Yeah. And Psycho Killer. Our first single and our first album. Yeah. Yeah, uh, At the power station, was that which he partly owned? He was building the power station at at the time. Right. Seymour Stein had some kind of deal with Tony. Tony had worked with the Ramones, and therefore Seymour liked him and wanted us to... We asked a few producers to work with us. Um, One was... (laughs) Be quiet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chris Thomas, we asked him. Yes. Thomas, he declined. So uh, we asked him. Uh, well, we can wait for the dogs. Yeah, let me let me get them out of here. Let's get out of here. Let's go. So, yeah, you end up with Tony Bon Jovi. I understood, though, that David didn't really want to sing in front of him. Wasn't there an issue there? When Tony Bon Jovi suggested that David sing Psycho Killer while holding a butcher knife in his hand, David thought, oh, no, 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 no. And um, this is our first time ever in a recording studio. And David was kind of a fragile person up here at that time. And we could see that, oh, this is not going well. Fortunately, the engineer, Ed Stasium, suggested that we just sort of go around Tony and record when Tony wasn't there. (laughs) And uh, that's what we did. But Tony hardly noticed because he had a number one song in America with disco Star Wars. (laughs) <laughs> remember that no that's this is the one where the guy was singing and he got him to hold a lightsaber in his hand is that right? <laughs> <laughs> let me just touch on some of the issues that came out of that first album though and that's 
which was becomes a bit of a long term thing between you and David, which is one of credits. There's, oh, credits! Yeah, there's a track called "Warning Sign," which <laughs> kind of says it in its title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What What was the situation, Chris, for you? Well, the situation was that I, I probably like you guys. I was brought up in a family that I, we were taught the golden rule: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. That's how we were raised. And that's how Tina was raised. I mean, David's parents were good people. I'm sure they told him this type of thing. But I didn't know that I couldn't trust him to do the right thing. I was a guy who liked to write, you know, liked to write words and lyrics and things. And, and he, uh, he eventually said, uh, no, no, I'm not going to sing the songs unless I write the lyrics. So I said, well, OK, all right, because when i saw the uh album cover for our first album i assumed that because i had written all of the lyrics for warning sign that it would be france and burn or burn and france but it wasn't it was all songs written by david burn and so i just thought oh damn but that was something that we learned to deal with this becomes a recurring problem doesn't it like you have with eno and his credits <laughs> It was a recurring problem, and it, I suppose we're, we're not alone in that respect, but it's kind of painful when that happens. But at the same time, I knew that we had such a good band and such an interesting band and so different from other bands that I thought, well, David's got a really unique perspective, and part of what people like about Talking Heads is the strangeness the oddness of David Byrne and his delivery. And I'm just going to have to learn to live with this situation, which is what I did. I guess it's worth it, isn't it? It, it was more important for me to keep the band going and to have some success with the band than to uh, quibble about mm -hmm. things. And uh, maybe I should have quibbled way back then but you but know how do you end up going into the next album do you have to have a negotiation about this you know we uh, if my memory serves me well i talked to david about it and he said oh we'll correct it on the second printing because he knew he had done this so okay we'll correct it on the second printing but then it continued to happen in one way or another you know uh, some people are just let me just say that some people don't know where they begin and other people where they end know, and yeah. they begin. The boundaries are not very well defined yeah. for them. No. But was there a sense of, of David thinking that you were a backing band, as it were, and that Talking Heads was him? I think he, he came to believe that. I think he came to believe that he was somehow more important to the band than the rest of us. Frontmen will do that. I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. But this must have been quite shocking for him when you released the first Tom Tom Club album and yeah. it goes gold. Yeah, I think it was really, uh, <laughs> I think he couldn't believe it. You know, he never really talked to us about it. But our manager, Gary Kerfers, we were sharing a cab in the days when they had checker cabs and you could fit the whole band and the manager in the back of a cab. We were going from uh, Gary's office downtown and Gary said, oh, guess what? I just found out the Tom Tom Club album went gold today. And Tina and I were like, whoa. But really, I wished he had picked another time to tell us that because <laughs> David just stared out the window and didn't say a thing. Oh, God. And, uh, wow. Yeah. You know. Time is marching on. I'm sorry we're taking so much of your time. Your tour of the UK with the Ramones is like the sort of Samuel Pepys diary of punk in Britain. It's like you sum it all up better than any of the bands that you had such, you saw everything. You know, you go to see The Clash one night you, and, and the jam at Brighton University. You go to, you, you're everywhere. Guy, I tend to think of Chris Moore as a Boswell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that extraordinary night in Glasgow, which must have been insane when all four of the CBGB's bands are playing on the same night, which is a, the worst bit of booking since someone booked Genesis and Michael Jackson to play the same night in Auckland in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, 
that was an amazing night. We played at Strathclyde University with the Ramones and television and Blondie were at the Apollo. Which is a big gig. I'm surprised they were playing somewhere so big that early. I'm not sure about Blondie at that point, but television was getting oh, enorm- of course, Mark Mark Moon, enormous yeah. adulation yeah. from the from the music. From the press. NME, yeah. And so were the Ramones. So I'm pretty sure both shows sold out. The booking Fantastic. was not really a problem. Yeah. But the party afterwards was a lot of fun, I can tell you. (laughs) Although Johnny didn't really like touring in Europe, apparently, did he? Johnny hated it. He just hated it. Every minute. Why is that? Is that a parochialness? He he didn't mind London so much. London was somehow okay. But every other part of England and every other part of Europe was just, you know, he didn't like the salads or the... (laughs) What did you know? What must be interesting is that... um, because the whole New York punk thing was so sort of revered and godlike to us. What did you know about the British punk thing in New York before you came here? Well, you know, we read the NME and we read yeah. Sounds and Melody Maker, all that. So we, we knew these bands by name. And I guess we'd heard the Sex Pistols. I don't know if the album was out yet, but we'd heard God yeah, Save the Queen. Yeah. We'd heard I'm So Bored with the USA and uh we weren't really (laughs) you know who we really liked was the slits yeah the slits were so much fun and and they were much nicer to us than the clash or (laughs) anyone else and and, it wasn't uh, cool to be nice to anyone don't take it personally chris we have to talk about eno because this is really important part of your career, obviously, working with Brian Eno. There's a story that you played the Rock Garden, which is a club I yeah. we played with early Spandau Ballet, before we were Spandau Ballet, back in the 70s, in Covent Garden in London. And Chris Thomas and Brian Eno and John Cale were all in the audience. Slogging and, out for your affection. And, and apparently Cale said, I was overheard saying to Eno, they're mine. You bugger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what he said. I heard it. Uh, But you ended up with Brian. We ended up with Brian. We had already made up our mind at that time that we would like to ask Brian, you know, to produce us. And we we knew John Cale from CBGBs and we had and still have enormous respect for him. But we felt like Brian was a better choice for us. I don't know why. It was just a feeling we had, I guess, from listening to his records like we loved Babies on fire and uh, here come the warm jets and all that. Type yeah, yeah, of absolutely. And is it true that the King's Lead Hat, which is the famous title of a brand new track, is that really an anagram of talking heads? Is that what happened? Yes, yes. I mean, he did that and, and that kind of sealed the deal for us. Wow. You know, there's an interesting side point here that apparently didn't he before you were in the picture, he went to New York to to potentially produce television and it just didn't happen. Yeah, that's a I've never understood that story, what the true story is yeah. there. But but I think what happened was. Uh, oh, I forget his name, but the A&R guy for Island at the time said, we'll make a demo with you. We'll pay for the recording, but only if Eno is the producer. So television agreed. And, uh, you know, Tom Verlaine is a persnickety guy. And he didn't like the nice way. Word. Well, you know, I'm an educated man. Well, you are. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> Tom didn't care for Brian's production values. And uh, that was that. But what did Brian bring to the table? What was he for talking? Because you did these three classic albums with him, didn't you? Uh, Fear of Music and, and and more songs about buildings and food and Remain in Light famously, which is strangely not your biggest selling record, but is probably yeah. seen as your but masterpiece ab- now. Epoch-defining yeah. record. Uh, what was it like being in the room and how different was it? All three records were very different. The first record, more songs about buildings and food. That was Tina's title, wasn't it, by the way? Isn't that quite a funny story? Actually, I believe it's my title. But Tina said, what do we call an album that's just about buildings and food? Uh, With songs about buildings and food. And I said, oh, let's call it more songs about food. food." (laughs) There you go. And, And Eno liked that idea and David and Jerry liked that idea. So we went with it. I know that Andy Partridge thinks I got the idea from him. 
that he had told us that from XTC. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't remember Andy saying that anyway, I'm taking credit for that. But Brian, the first album was pretty easy for Brian because we had most of those songs we had been touring with and we had been performing for, for months and months and we were really super tight and we could just play them in our sleep pretty much. The second album, Fear of Music, well, let me just say that, so what Brian did was he, he brought in his because the band was so tight on more songs about buildings and food, he brought in his little pocket synthesizer and he would treat various instruments, oh, yes. particularly oh, the, the drums, Yes, particularly the drums. And it gave us a, a new and exciting and really kind of like, I don't want to say avant-garde, but a real edgy sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, the album did very well. He also, to his credit, we had been performing Take Me to the River live but we had been playing it at the tempo of the original version, which is kind of up tempo. But he said, why don't you slow it down? Like as slow, play it as slowly as you can without completely falling apart. And so we did that. And uh, that was our first hit single. By the way, but the first proper big band I ever played for was Ice House, this Australian band. And we used to do in our set, your version of Take Me to the River. Ah, good for you. <laughs> well, then the second album we did with Brian Eno, you know, Fear of Music, was recorded in the loft where Tina and I lived in Long Island City, just right across the, the Queensboro Bridge from New York, from Manhattan. And we got the record plant mobile to come and park outside and ran the cables up the stairs and up the fire escape. And we, we recorded as if playing live. And Brian was great for that. You know, and the thing about Brian Eno is he, he really doesn't care about hits. What he cares about is doing something that people will never forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, he was a great producer for us because he kept raising the bar. Like, that was good, but is that all you got? <laughs> And did David and Brian get on? I mean, because I see them as being two quite, you know, powerful people. Yes, they got on very well. We all got along very well with Brian. And was he using the oblique strategies on you at that point? Was he those cards that you, you shuffle and pull out ideas? We knew about the oblique strategies and we kind of thought they were amusing, but we didn't really. The thing with the oblique strategies is they're actually there for when things aren't working. Do yeah, you know I mean? if you're actually coming up with stuff, you don't need them. <laughs> yeah, <Right. laughs> I, I think we might have used them a little bit in the next album, uh, uh, "Remain in Light," right. which was back down at Compass Point, and that record from the beginning was very challenging, but in a good way. And nothing was written before we went into the studio. Was that deliberate? So came out of was that jam sessions? Yeah, the idea was that with Remain in Light is that we would go into the studio as Miles Davis had with a bunch of cats, jazz cats, and just press record and everybody would jam out. And then Teo, whatever his name was, the, the producer. Oh, Teo Massero. Yeah, Teo Massero yes. would take a knife and scissors and a razor blade and edit the tape and put all the good parts together. And there you would have this jazz masterpiece. So that was the concept. And Eno was playing with you in this band, wasn't he? Once in a while, Eno would play, but Eno would be the first to tell you that he's not really much of a player. Okay. He's more of a uh, behind the scenes guy. Hmm. I think he played bass on one thing, and I think he maybe played a little keyboards on one thing. And I'm not sure if they ever even got used. Where he was much more helpful was in the vocal arranging. Like uh, he came up with the letting the days go by, let the water oh, yeah, yeah. Now. You know, that even sounds like Eno. But it does very much, yeah. So it was a real group effort. And afterwards, Brian and David both thought, this is fantastic. We're gonna take credit for this. And they did, they basically, uh, tried to write the rest of the band out of the picture. 
which was not nice. In the songwriting credits, you mean? The songwriting in... credits and in every interview they did. Oh, wow. That's really not nice. Nobody ever said, oh, the bass guitar is fantastic when they were doing interviews about the... Uh, the groove. The groove. Yeah. Uh, which uh, it is. It, it's epochal. It's, it's one of my favorite bass lines ever. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't Brian ask to be a member of the band on the credits? Too? Brian wanted to, to say... Remain in Light by David Byrne, Brian Eno, and Talking Heads. Oh, my God. All right. So it's a kind of extension of The Bush of Ghosts. Yes. Life in the yes, Bush of that's Ghosts. what they thought. The Bush of Ghosts had not come out yet, you see. Everybody was wondering, like, what the hell are we going to do with this record, The Bush of Ghosts, you know, at the record <laughs> company? So it hadn't come out yet. Eventually it did to great acclaim and with good reason, but... <laughs> Brian wanted his name on the front of the album. And Gary Kerfers said, well, Brian, are you going to be able to tour behind this album? Because, you know, we're, we're expecting to tour about nine months when this album is released. And Brian said, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that. You know, I don't tour. Gary said, well, your fans are going to be awfully disappointed when you're not on stage. So I don't think we should put your name on the album not like that. <laughs> and that. Brian. That's good management. That is. Yes. Brian eventually <laughs> understood the situation. And, uh, but you know, he still got all songs written by David Byrne, Brian Eno and talking heads on the back. Right. Which is, yeah. You managed to hold on with, for another 10 years, pretty much. I mean, obviously speaking in tongues becomes your biggest selling record. And we've already spoken about that and the stop making sense film is extraordinary that jonathan demi did but really i suppose eventually things were not going to last oh what about naked what was that like well naked was we had a ball because we were in paris for like two yeah, months that's right. and johnny marr and people coming in oh did johnny play on it i didn't yeah, know that. johnny played on it johnny played on a couple of songs thanks to steve lillywhite yeah steve lillywhite called him up and said come on over and play some 12 string which he did it was a wonderful experience for us, although later David said that it was one of the worst experiences of his life. So I, I really don't know why that was. So you didn't feel it was going to break down at this point? No, everything was different than it had been at the beginning, but it was still going strong. I it's mean, like, were you having to climb the mountain with the credits every time you made a record? Almost every time. Wow. It didn't happen on Naked for some reason. I'm not sure why. But recording in Paris with those great African musicians mm -hmm. and uh, our good friend Wally Badaru was, oh, was well, yeah. just a wonderful experience. And, you know, it, it's an album that not too many people have said great things about, but I really like it. I like it. I really like it a lot. And in say. fact, that song, yeah. Nothing But Flowers, is one of my favorite. Yeah. Did you tour it? No, we didn't because uh, David had said Talking Heads don't need to tour anymore. Because, you know, that was another reason you never played Live Aid, right? Yes, that's correct. Wow. Before you go, I need to, we want to hear about the Happy Mondays experience yes. because, ah. we, you know, we had Alan McGee on the other week and uh, we kind of, we, I guess because through him, Seymour Stein must have said, oh, how, how about you guys to produce the Happy Mondays album? Is that what happened? Maybe that happened. I'm not sure. I have. Were they not on Sire? Or were they on Sire? Have I got that wrong? No, they were, uh, Happy Mondays were on uh Electra in America. Okay. All we know is I got a call from their manager, Nathan McGough. Nathan, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nathan called up and said, uh, look, I'm in New York with Paul Ryder, Sean's brother, and uh, we'd like to come up and see you. And I thought, oh, okay, sure. So they came up on the train from Manhattan to Connecticut, and, and uh, we had a nice lunch, very civilized. And they, they said, we, we'd like you and Tina to produce the next Happy Mondays album. And we didn't know very much about Happy Mondays. All we knew is they were a hit making <laughs> band from <laughs> Manchester and that they were assigned to factory records. And we had enormous respect for Tony. Yeah, and we course. thought, you know, why not? They want to do it in Barbados. That sounds great. Let's do it. We didn't know about their whole, uh, <clears throat> you know, yeah. Backstory. I think for Sean not a crackhead at that point. I think he, <laughs> he became a crackhead when he went to Barbados uh, wow. because there was no heroin on that island. And uh, they thought, oh, that'll be good for Sean. Well, what they didn't realize was that the substitute 
was worse than the heroin. Yeah. And um, it was an ordeal. It was a real yeah. ordeal. I, I got my first gray hairs there. Oh. It was just a nightmare. But it, in, retro, in, in retrospect, I mean, we had the police calling us up in the studio. The, the you know the police that had put Jerry Hall behind bars down there. <laughs> and, and we, they said, "We know what's going on. You better get your boys under control, or we're gonna uh, like bust the studio." Things like that were happening all the time, and they crashed five cars. I thought it was more. Because funnily enough, just after you'd done the album, I went there. I went to that studio with Gary Moore. And the funny thing is, our hire cars never showed up. And anything we ordered from anywhere, just said, we're, you know, it's a English band at Blue Wave. And everyone, the hire couple were like, no way. No one's <laughs> getting anything. We couldn't get anything from anyone because uh, of the, the reputation of the Mondays. No, I'm very sorry. <laughs> podcast on a, no. a bad note with that album i think what was nice was when you guys all got the recognized at the rock and roll mm -hmm. hall of fame and you got inducted into rock and roll hall of fame and you all got back together again in 2002 and i watched that and uh it's brilliant you're playing everyone is playing so well oh thank you very much what's coming up chris what's coming up for me i'm gonna be working on a second book and um Tina and I, we're getting our studio brought up to date. We invested a lot of money on, on a new Pro Tools rig about 10 years ago. You know Pro Tools. And um, yeah. we used to call it the mixing desk, but now they call it the controller. Uh, the controller, which we bought 10 years ago, suddenly went kaput. And uh, so we started making calls around the country. Who has one of these in good working order? And we finally found one. It was for sale. And guess who we got it from? The Wu-Tang Clan. Yay! <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're back. Tina and I want to do some more recording. We're of a certain age now, and we, we don't expect, you know, nobody's really breaking down our door for a new, new record from us or anything like that. But we feel like we still have a couple of interesting songs up our sleeve. And are you still in touch with David at all? You know, we communicate by email. We're very fortunate in that we get to license our songs to movies and television mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. And we do pretty well at that. So we go back and forth about that, but nothing really what you would call social. It's civil. It's civil. It's business. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. And we've really taken up a lot of your time, but your story oh. is so, so deep. It's become something of a cliche for us, with people, which is that we've barely scratched the surface. Ah, uh, <laughs> well, it was fun talking to you guys. I hope I don't have to wait another 40 years to speak to you again. Yes. <laughs> I, I hope so too, Gary. If, if I'm fortunate enough to come to the UK or you're in New York, get in touch. Please pass on our best to Tina. To, as a fellow bass player, I revere her. You so. bet. I'd be happy. Yeah. And actually, I was thinking how she, only one other person, Guy, other than you, because you're a great mover on stage, you're a bass player who really can dance, oh. is Tina, right? Yes. <laughs> She's something else. She is something else. She's absolutely thank brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you. Much, all the best, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Ciao. Very good. Wow. Lovely. That was like a sort of long summer lunch. It was, wasn't it? That's a very good comparison. I mean, obviously, we spent a lot of time down in New York in the 70s because yeah. it's a fascinating period. In, in, in Especially now, you know, as it recedes off into history, I was thinking, because when you read about it, that, that whole early 70s scene in the Bowery and everything, it, it now feels like reading about the beat poets in the 50s or something. It's yeah. got that legendary uh, air to it, you know. Absolutely. And it was glad we, you know, Hilly Crystal got the credit he deserved in in this show, although yeah. he's no longer with us now, I no. would imagine. And we're no longer with you in about two seconds, because we've got to say goodbye, because this has been a long one. <laughs> but we <laughs> will be back next week, right? Good night from me. And it's good night for all of them. Look at that.